des gestionnaires. Euh, cette... Welcome to the second day of virtual training workshop on ecological wetland restoration for wetland managers. Today we will have uh, Hugo Fontes. Unfortunately, François Meslet uh, will not be here. We are going to speak about experiences and practices of Mediterranean wetland restoration. Then uh, there will be a coffee break from 10.45 to 11. And then uh, a virtual visit by Hugo Fontes. Some practical information about this wetland, uh, sorry, um, the, this workshop. Please note that this webinar will be recorded in both French and English. Your camera and microphone are automatically disactivated and there is a simultaneous uh, translation in English. And there is also a, a button you can use for Q&As, uh, and uh, we will answer. Now I give the floor to Hugo Fontes. Bonjour à tous. Donc, je m'appelle Hugo Fontes, je suis ingénieur de recherche. My name is Hugo Fontes. I am uh, an expert at the Tour du Vala. I'm going to make a presentation this Recording morning. Recording in progress. Voilà, ça, ça commence à enregistrer. Donc, je recommence. Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Hugo Fontes. Je suis ingénieur de recherche en écologie. My name végétale. is Hugo Fontes. I work at the Tour du Vala. De restauration écologique. Je vous faire aujourd'hui donc une présentation. Today I'm going to speak on behalf of François Meslard that I had to make this presentation, but unfortunately he couldn't be here, so I apologize in advance in case of any hesitations, and we will also try to answer your questions. Alors donc on va vous présenter ici des exemples de restauration des zones humides. We are going to present you some experiences uh, and examples of restoration of Mediterranean wetlands, in particular passive and active restoration interventions. Et notamment dans un contexte scientifique. Uh, et dans un second temps, et un peu plus rapidement, on vous présentera uh, la planification de la restauration. Et Then we are going to speak about the restoration planning, de, et de and in particular monitoring and evaluation. Donc le contexte général de la restauration écologique, si vous avez déjà eu un... Some general uh, information on the general context. Uh, um, yesterday we already presented some information. The purpose is to restore degraded ecosystems and to restore the conditions of the reference ecosystems. So reference ecosystems are natural ecosystems that have not been degraded. So this is the objective uh, of uh, uh, ecological restoration, and uh, there are several ways to do that. Pardon. Le premier de savoir si les conditions environnementales de l'écosystème dégradé sont toujours favorables et toujours favorables pour les espèces cibles de la de la restauration. Donc finalement, sont toujours similaires à l'état de référence. Et donc pour ça, il faut aussi Euh, savoir si le, le pool régional d'espèces est bien est bien présent et donc on va pouvoir coloniser ce, ce milieu. Donc ce qui pose la question de la nécessité de, de forcer ou de laisser faire la, la dispersion des espèces. Et ensuite, euh, il y a la question de la du contrôle de la compétition, donc finalement de jouer sur les relations biotiques qui existent entre les espèces euh, qui peuvent favoriser ou défavoriser l'installation des, des espèces de référence, des espèces cibles euh, de notre écosystème. Donc il y a des restaurations que l'on dit passives et d'autres que l'on dit actives. Euh, dans le cas d'une restauration... So there are active and passive interventions. In this graph, you can see the trajectory of the uh, reference uh, ecosystem. This ecosystem is a system that is uh, degraded. You can see this red point that is a degraded state of the ecosystem. 
écosystème dégradé de rejoindre sa trajectoire. And uh, the question is if it is possible to return to the initial trajectory, so the reference trajectory, and if possible, what to do? Dans le cas où un écosystème ne peut pas se restaurer tout seul. Of course, uh, ecosystems cannot uh, be restored by themselves. So, if uh, degradation has taken place, then uh, there has been a loss of biodiversity or functioning. And so, restoration means that we have to support this ecosystem that is not uh, sufficiently resilient to go back to the uh, initial trajectory. And uh, if it is uh, resilient, we can change uh, management slightly in order to support it and to go back to the initial trajectory. Ne permettent pas de refaire, de re reenclencher une dynamique favorable pour cet écosystème. Il va y avoir besoin d'être un peu plus interventionniste. Et donc, Instead, coup, if this does not work, then we have to uh, use an active uh, restoration intervention. So I'm going to present this concept and I'm going to speak about uh, the restoration of temporary marshes. Temporary marshes uh, are aquatic uh, areas that are flooded uh, for part of the year and uh, dry for the rest of the year. They are quite frequent in areas with uh, marked uh, rainfall seasons, uh, for example, in the Mediterranean. And in the Mediterranean, this is the case in autumn and spring. And there is a great diversity of situation according to climate, uh, operation, connectivity, soil management, uses, etc. Voilà un peu pour illustrer la, la diversité des situations des marées temporaires. On a des milieux qui sont aussi artificiels. Hein. On voit ici des salins. Des, des... Here you have a great diversity of situations uh, at different altitudes. Donc, ce sont des milieux qui sont temporairement inondés. Euh, et cette inondation a un très fort, une très forte influence sur. Euh, Wetlands, uh, um, with temporary flooding, we have to consider that uh, there may be contrasting functions and challenges. There are areas that can be flooded more frequently or less frequently. There are also. Wetlands where ponds can be isolated or connected. Environmental important with these milieux permanent, and others will be much more isolated. And we have also, of course, all the questions of. And of course, uh, there are many variants uh, depending on substrate, climate, and uh, biogeography. Donc, selon la définition de Ramsar, euh, according une... to the Ramsar definition, temporary pond uh, is a, a small and shallow ecosystem, usually less than 10 hectares, characterized by alternating dry and flooded phases and by highly autonomous hydrological functioning. So, all the uh, systems that are flooded by the rain. Here you can see the great diversity of Mediterranean temporary uh, pools, and uh, you can see also uh, pools in areas where we have rocks, and uh, these pools are created by the rocks and the water that is accumulated in these uh, rocks. There are many uh, sectors that are important uh, for uh, Mediterranean temporary pools, and you can see that they are scattered all around the Mediterranean. We have quite many, and uh, uh, we have also a number of types of red plants characteristic of Mediterranean temporary uh, pools. So there are organisms that are quite adapted to these particular conditions. So endemism is quite high and quite important. We have 78 species in the Mediterranean basin, and the 39 are dependent on temporary ponds, and 58% are endemic species. 
There are many, many threats, especially due to changes in hydrological functioning, uh, plant uh, succession, for example, in case of abandonment of traditional activities like grazing. These areas are also affected by human activities like agriculture and there are also pollutants like phosphorus, nitrogen, pesticides used in crops. On a effectivement aussi le, le, le problème des espèces exotiques en Then there is also the problem of invasive alien species in these areas and of course there is also a threat related to the management or use, especially when urban structures are built. Here you can see in these aerial pictures that there are some temporary ponds that were totally destroyed due to urbanization. And here you see that also waste disposal was carried out. Eutrophication, eutrophication is a problem for Mediterranean ponds. And the problem when we have <coughs> algae is that the light cannot filter. Donc on a des, 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 des menaces qui peuvent être des destructions directes. Par le... So there can be a direct destruction due to urban development, uh, but also another threat is the extraction of uh, material, in particular clay. And then overgrazing uh, is uh, an important uh, example of threat, especially in the southern Mediterranean basin. Entraîner la destruction de, de certains, certaines mares et marées temporaires. And uh, as we said, uh, then also agriculture, water pollution, and then climate change, and of course the cumulative impact of all these threats. Here on your right hand side, you can see over grazing, and then uh, in the lower image, uh, you can see some uh, dry areas. Uh, and this was due to the use of uh, water, so the area became uh, dry and the resources uh, were depleted. And uh, then we can see uh, waste disposal. So uh, these temporary ponds and pools are very important and they are affected by pressures and uh, threats. And there are restoration projects that have been launched in order to restore them. The most important uh, factor to restore temporary ponds uh, is uh, considered hydrology that is required for the existence of these ponds. And of course, hydrology is important for flora and fauna in these areas. And then also salinity, that is an important variable that can affect the development of organisms. And then uh, hydrology is also linked to the, the summer drying that can prevent the dominance of competitive perelian species. And then there are some species that may have different characteristics and they may vary, vary according to the level of salinity. So also this variable is important in order to maintain a diversity. And of course, uh, conditions may vary one year um, by year. And uh, also uh, salinity may be higher or lower in the different years. So this is something that is important to consider because this affects ecosystems. Uh, so there may be a variability of these conditions and so there may be a variable um, natural potential also vegetation and its distribution can vary 
from one year to another one, and there may be also interannual variants. So it is important to characterize the hydrological functioning of the site in order to restore the flooding conditions. Here uh, we have uh, the example of ephemeral ponds that only exist for a short period of time. Usually they are created by rains and in order to restore hydrology the first thing to do is to identify the disturbances uh, that may include the drainage and uh, also the changes related to the catchment area because of course catchment area may vary according to the rainfall and then also the surface of the catchment area. So these elements can have an impact. And catchment area can change in case dikes were built. So if we wanted to restore hydrology, we needed to restore the surface of the catchment area that existed at the beginning in order to have a, qu a water quantity that is sufficient for the pond to be uh, restored. Then depths can also have uh, um, an impact. Climate also plays a, a role, and this cannot really be managed. But in any case, the quantity of uh, rainfall and the distribution of rainfall is important, and also evapotranspiration. Of course, today we have a context of climate change, but in any case, some uh, managers usually uh, offset uh, climate change by using uh, canals and uh, water inputs. What is important to restore hydrology is to characterize the reference state. So we need to know the initial state and the initial conditions. This, if we wanted to restore the original species that were present, we also have to know the historical reference rate. So the conditions that existed before the site was degraded, and therefore we need to use the data, the information we have, and compare information with the reference data and the information in terms of water levels, the rainfalls, the size of the catchment area, etc. We need to characterize the initial state and then, once uh, this is done, we can uh, carry out the restoration intervention. We need to monitor water levels and quality, of course. So, reconstructing hydrology is a, a very precise objective that can also lead to hydrological modeling. We need to define a water volume that uh, will be present in the temporary pond, but we have to consider also evaporation and other variables. Et ça, donc, euh, ce, et ça, cette, cette taille de, de la mare et du bassin versant euh, va être, va directement impacter euh, les régimes d'inondation. And of course, the size of the pond may uh, vary. Uh, 
One thing that can be done is stripping of uh, surface, so soil stripping uh, in order to increase uh, the depth and the volume of uh, the temporary pond. And in this example, you can see on your left hand side uh, the initial uh, pond uh, that existed and then the new pond that is uh, much uh, deeper in the central part so now it can host uh, several species uh, voilà donc un simple des fois dans dans ce cas là une un, un creusement uh, un décapage léger uh, peut permettre de in this case uh, also a small soil stripping may be enough to restore the initial hydrological conditions et évidemment ces ces opérations ont un coût ici qui était de de 3500 in this case the area was 530 um, square meters here you have a picture about another example and this area is subject to fires fires destroy vegetation and expose huge surfaces of soil and of course then we have to avoid erosion and watershed after fire because this could create problems in the temporary pond the most important thing is to rebuild hydrology especially in areas that have been destroyed by uh, rice crops so for example as it is the case in Camargue in the south of France uh, these areas were exploited for agricultural purposes so the main problem is here for the uh, reconstruction of uh, ponds was uh, water infiltration and here we mostly had uh, sand uh, and uh, the risk was to have a strong water infiltration and uh, therefore water filters in the soil and it is not collected so uh, we need also to consider the substrate and the soil and in particular we have to measure the substrate heterogeneity because uh, we need uh, to have uh, the proper substrate it is also possible to remedy by using uh, a clay uh, waterproof layer of uh, clay because uh, this is something that exists uh, in uh, ponds, but then we have to consider the layer of uh, clay that has to be used. Usually 20 centimeters of clay um, gives, uh, provides uh, a sufficient uh, level. As regards uh, eutrophication, that is, is another problem in these areas. Uh, eutrophication favors competitive species uh, and commonplace uh, species, uh, including invasive uh, uh, species, uh, to the detriment of rare species. Uh. So eutrophication can uh, result from changes in the hydrogeological regime. But uh, it may also uh, result from uh, the historical use of these uh, temporary ponds when, for example, ponds were used for agricul agricultural purposes and uh, uh, soil was enriched with organic matter, nutrients, uh, etc. And uh, maybe it is now too uh, rich for uh, local species. Then we have to restore oligotrophy. One possibility that exists and that has been used is 
to uh, reduce uh, plant biomass. So here we have to stop the presence of algae and we can export this algae in order to reduce the um, total quantity if this uh, eutrophization is linked to a change in the hydrological regime of course we need to restore the initial hydrologic regime before doing that because that is uh, the root cause of eutrophization then there is another threat that is the reduced gene flows. Uh, there are some species like Mastilea strigosa that is uh, protected in uh, France uh, and is uh, endangered in South of France. And uh, well, this species. Uh, have, has a, a very original uh, DNA and uh, destroying this uh, species means destroying a part of the genetic uh, species and the biodiversity. So there may be also the problem of uh, fencing that could uh, prevent uh, the uh, circulation of these uh, species. Then there is uh, the issue of colonization. In the case of restoration of temporary ponds, uh, species uh, can or cannot colonize restored uh, areas. We know that uh, there are areas, uh, there are species uh, that uh, cannot arrive by uh, water others that can arrive by water. So when we restore uh, wetlands, uh, we need uh, to consider the species, the existing species, uh, and uh, in particular if they are isolated, and what is the probability that these uh, species can spontaneously resettle in the restored area. Dispersal can often be ensured by wild and domestic fauna. A landscape structure can play a major role in dispersion of fauna. Here you can see that the dispersion of seeds diminishes. And also the landscape structure plays an important role sur la, la probabilité de dispersion des espèces de marques temporaires. Par exemple, une marque est très enclavée. Par exemple, une réouverture du... When we have an area that is uh, isolated or a pond that is uh, isolated, uh, this can be Alors, prevented. Uh, in case of absence of target species, uh, we need to characterize the situation, and this means that we may ask ourselves why a population has disappeared from the area. Species can be absent for a number of reasons, and they can have been absent, absent for years. So now the question is, is hydrology normally functioning? So we have to study and see whether the species are not present because seeds are not present in the seed bank or whether um, if the hydrological conditions are not good. So and another thing is the vegetation structure that can also affect the situation. And the seed stock in the soil can often explain the absence of the species. In order to check that we can carry out germination tests. And as I said before, distance from natural populations and the existence of potential vectors that can uh, help uh, recolonize and uh, restore the area may be lower or uh, higher and this can explain and this can be the reason why there are no uh, species or not certain species in an area. We are now going to make a short uh, break for a technical reason. Thank you. <laughs> 
Donc, il y a plusieurs causes d'absence de, d'espèces de, cibles dans les, dans les milieux restaurés, notamment quand, quand on parle de la, de la végétation. Euh, donc déjà, c'est des questions de dynamique de population. Est-ce qu'on a des tailles de population qui sont suffisantes et qu'on n'a pas des populations en, en déclin euh, et du fait de, de facteurs environnementaux, donc on, on l'a vu, l'eutrophisation, la sédimentation, la qualité de l'eau, et aussi le, la gestion, et notamment l'herbivorie euh, sauvage ou domestique, qui peut euh, réduire des, des espèces vivaces très compétitrices, qui elles rentrent en compétition avec, le, avec les espèces cibles, de manière assez fréquente. Donc se pose la question, si ces espèces ne sont pas présentes, de les introduire. Euh, voilà par exemple le, le cas de Isoète cétacea, qui est une, une, une isoètre protégée nationale dans, dans le sud de la France, qui est une espèce à très forte valeur patrimoniale. Euh, et donc la question c'est, est-ce euh, que les populations existent encore sur le site Donc on a étudié... Uh, the, the population still exists uh, in the site. Uh, we have to study the uh, presence of uh, this uh, species. And uh, the thing is that uh, even if it is almost absent uh, in the site, uh, we have uh, some spores that are present, uh, in particular, in uh, the superficial layer of the soil. So there is an abundance of these uh, spores in the seed stocks. So it is not because of the absence of spores uh, that we do not have these uh, species. So There may be environmental factors that may not allow these species to develop. So it is the degradation of the environmental conditions that played a role in the disappearance of these species. In any case, we need to study the seed stock. Uh, ensuite, des a des Then the introduction of species that has uh, possible consequences that may vary. For example, we carried out a study for the construction of 256 temporary oleotrophic ponds in different uh, sites. Here you see four target species that were sown in different periods uh, of time. And uh, also a follow-up, a medium-term follow-up was carried out after this intervention. And you can see from the graphs that uh, The frequency of target species is uh, higher, so target plants are more abundant in seeded ponds, even if uh, the difference declined to reverse in the last year, after six years in particular. So, We have seen that after a certain number of years, uh, the favorable uh, conditions, la bonne trajectoire du milieu avec une abondance, led uh, to the original trajectory. Where degraded. And basically, the difference uh, uh, declined between seeded and not seeded ponds. Instead, as regards invasive uh, species, we have more abundant uh, invasive species in controlled than in seeded ponds. So you can see that the difference is higher at the beginning and then it reduces and there is a convergence at the end between seeded and not seeded ponds. So there is an effect, but it is a short term effect. So the interest to introduce the seeds is limited in this case. There are 
to research conclusions, to limit invasions, we need to plant similar species. So species that are similar to target species, introduce species taxonomically close to invasive species, and this is what we call the limiting similarity. Uh, but we have seen uh, that uh, similar species uh, may tend uh, to be more uh, competitive. So if a species uh, arrives earlier and if uh, it has uh, the tendency to use more resources, uh, if it is uh, planted earlier, this will have effects on the long term. And therefore, we need to introduce target species quite quickly, even before these invasive and similar species, in order to avoid a possible competition. Speaking about competition, the loss of some species in particular, target species can also uh, happen by uh, plant colonization, not necessarily invasive space, species. For example, species that can develop in temporary ponds. And in this case, this invasive species uh, may prevent the development of target species. So these species can be really competitive. You can see here an example, an area where there is a lot of competition to your right-hand side and a different situation on your left-hand side. You see that the water level is the same, but you see that the plant situation is totally different. In order to remedy this problem, one of the solutions after restoring the physical conditions is to to cut the plant biomass and clearing organic matter. And if this operation is repeated, maybe through grazing, uh, the development of this species uh, may be reduced. And there is also another possibility. We can uh, use uh, a light uh, soil uh, stripping, but this can create a problem. In particular, it may affect the seed bank. Generally speaking, uh, in the first centimeters of soil, we have uh, seeds and so we have to pay attention to avoid destroying the seed bank while using a soil stripping. So my suggestion is to at least study the seed bank and the first centimeters of soil because the soil stripping may destroy these seeds. So grazing is probably more effective and less uh, destroying because the soil stripping can be quite traumatic for nature. For example, in the rock called pond, a study on the seed bank was carried out. So we know that uh, there are spores uh, present on the soil. They could develop, but they actually do not develop. So the main assumption was that uh, there is too much vegetation, uh, too many competitive species, uh, especially uh, food. So the idea is to clear the area and to export 
de mare où il y a eu ces, Dra. Euh, la fauche, la fauche de la végétation. Marché, ça euh, Ouais. En matière organique, on a un développement qui est plus important. These interventions have been used, and we have seen that the results were better. So we have simply restored the conditions that were favorable to these species by limiting the growing of a vegetation. Here is another example. Here, there has been a loss of herbivores. There are no more herbivores on the site, and this has led to uh, an accumulation of sediments and exclusion of grazing, and then a loss of biodiversity. So the technique that was used here was a clearing and a light stripping of the organic matter. What we have seen in this marsh in the south of France is that between 2001 and 2002, when we carried out the clearing interventions, there were no differences in terms of target species. The site where vegetation cutting was carried out between 2001 and 2002. Uh, there were no uh, sites. And then there were no species, but then the species reappeared. And there is also another problem related to alien species, invasive species. Here we have Paspalum dilatatum, that is an American species. It is a typical of uh, temporary bonds, and uh, here you have another example of uh, uh, cutting and uh, clearing. But we've seen that uh, these interventions have failed, and uh, in this case, the control was made by cutting. But uh, this species is uh, quite lively, and uh, the intervention didn't work. So here, if you look at the results, uh, in the first centimeters, uh, there are many target uh, species, and uh, in the depth of soil, uh, we have uh, non-target uh, species. For example, uh, Paspalum dilatatum, that is an invasive species, uh, an alien species. So, it is not possible to eliminate, to remove these species by clearing or stripping up, because if we use these techniques, uh, we are going to destroy the seed stocks. Uh, this is the picture that I showed you before about uh, the Ocrium aristatum. There is uh, one single site in uh, uh, France, and this uh, species is present in a temporary pond. In order to protect this species, there was a prohibition of grazing. And after grazing was prohibited, we have assisted to a reduction or a disappearance of this species. So the idea was that a grazing was probably not such a great problem. And also, an experimental study was carried out in order to reintroduce grazing in a control area. And here you can see the area where um, pasture is not possible and the area where pasture is uh, possible. And the result uh, is quite evident, the grazed area. Hosts, uh, a variable number of species, several hundreds of species. Instead, in the area where we do not have uh, grazing, there are just uh, a few species. Uh, so clearly, we can see that uh, grazing has a favorable uh, 
impact on uh, these areas. So grazing was reintroduced in 2001, and uh, there has been a stronger increase in the population of these uh, species. If we continue with the restoration of temporary marshes, restoration is when uh, we try to go back to the original status, but there are even other activities that are possible, like rehabilitation, when we simply want to re-establish certain uh, uh, conditions, uh, and then there is a recreation, uh, so uh, marsh can be recreated, and uh, maybe the uh, recreated marsh is not uh, exactly like the marsh that used to exist in that same place. So this is part of uh, restoration. But in any case, uh, these activities are not a proper restoration because we do not go back to the reference stasis. Here are some examples of a passive restoration by grass grazing and flooding. We are still in the south of France, in uh, Camargue. Here we have uh, former rice fields. There has been an experimentation that was carried out in order to understand the combined effects of floodings and grazing. And uh, we are in an area that uh, was uh, a temporary marsh in the 40s. So the uh, temporary marshes uh, were then uh, destroyed in the 60s uh, for agricultural purposes. Some areas have been flooded and others were not. And uh, we can see that the flooded uh, parcels uh, without grazing uh, have a higher number of species compared to those that were not flooded. And we see a variable number of species according to the duration of the flooding. Instead, with grazing, uh, we can see that more or less the trend is the same. But uh, the presence uh, is more important because grazing, as I said, uh, and we've already seen some examples, uh, limits uh, competitive species and allows other species to grow. There is also an example that is quite uh, interesting and that concerns. Uh, but uh, when we have uh, non-grazed areas, we may have specific uh, consequences on the presence of uh, ducks and aquatic birds in general. So flooding uh, plus grazing means higher numbers of, of uh, common teal per hectare. As I said before, this was a natural area in the 40s and it was destroyed in the 60s. Then uh, in the 90s, uh, there were some experiments, and today these parcels are free to develop. From these aerial pictures, we see the current situation and the results of the experiment that was carried out. For example, we see these parcels here. Here, the vegetation is richer if we compare the picture with the current picture. But the uh, situation today is uh, a situation where vegetation is free to develop. Another example is uh, the Lake Prespac example. It is a, a cross-border lake between Greece, Albania, and uh, we have uh, studied uh, this lake in particular. We are in a context where there has been a drastic loss 
of a wet meadows. And so there has been a decrease in fish. What we have uh, seen is the need to control the colonization of reeds because while preserving the reed bed, conservation issues that exist for many birds. So we need to preserve reeds, of course, but also reed beds. And we have uh, an opportunity of um, the cow that can make it possible uh, with its um, action on the raid to restore uh, this um, area. So the objective is to um, recreate these um, wetlands, uh, which have a very important uh, ecological value. So we do this uh, through the construction of a new um, sluice gate between the two lakes, which makes it possible to control the level of the water and through the introduction of the water buffalo. Uh, so this is a kind of buffalo that is um, adjusted to the environment and um, as a tourist um, interest, for uh, this site. And uh, we see uh, that um, it has an effect on vegetation. It makes it possible to have a telegeneity, um, a mosaic of different environments, which is very interesting, especially for the reproduction of uh, carbs. And it creates um, diversified uh, conditions, which are very interesting for um, the feeding of uh, some bird species. So here um, we can see the lake, uh, so we can uh, see the um, preservation of uh, this uh, fringe of reeds, uh, which um, exists for long, and so there is uh, a very interesting uh, landscape for flora and um, fauna that exist in this lake. So now let's see some examples of active restorations. Just a few clarifications. Um, passive restoration is uh, a restoration which uh, makes, um, which uses management um, ways uh, such as um, uh, grazing participation um, in systems which are already um, a traditional. So passive restoration can also um, can um, can have no influence on um, plants. So here we have some. Um, we can see some examples of uh, active uh, restoration. So once again, we are in um, the delta of Rhone, which is uh, a site which is um, historically. Uh, historically, um, an area of marshes, and the, they are connected to um, the Rhone a River that has caused uh, some marshes. Uh, it is a space which was used for agriculture, on, uh, for the production of rice, the cultivation of uh, rice, and um, it has been used also for the production of animal feeding. Uh, so here on this project, uh, a very scientific approach has been uh, followed. Uh, so as um, I said, on um, uh, some... Um, uh, so um, trust in the building, uh, of um, graves through the destruction of uh, temporary marshes. The objective is uh, the creation of temporary marshes, Mediterranean temporary marshes, and so marshes which uh, are um, very rich in biodiversity, both in terms of flora and uh, fauna, which um, are present here. So first question, are the target species already there? There's a study um, of the seed bank, so a sample collection. So we can um, see the seed bank 
The answer is very simple. There are no target seeds found in the soil and which um, will uh, be present in the soil of this um, space. And then, second question, can the target seeds come by water or wind? Uh, so this is a site on which there is a pumping system, and so there is a study of the seeds which was transferred by irrigation channels on the marshes and some blocks which make it possible to collect the seeds coming from the wind. So the answer in um, this case is very simple, there are no target seeds are coming through water or wind and uh, but there are many other seeds and so we have 23 percent of seeds that come which are wheat connected to rice fields um, and 19 percent rural and entrophilous species uh, so mm, and then 48 percent of hygrophilous species that can exist in an environment but um, they are uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, such as the aster, etc. Uh, so here we do not have a seed bank, um, um, specific seed banks, and so we decide to do the active restoration, so to introduce uh, desired species in order to in order to develop a target community. Uh, so we can say that active restoration is uh, necessary, but uh, there is a third question. Would the environmental conditions allow for the it allow the target species to develop? So is uh, are the conditions of the soil enough? Um, is the richness of the soil favorable for the development of these species? And we see that um, the surface soil is uh, richer than uh, the deep soil, and so uh, there are uh, there are many many nutrients such as nitrogen, carbon, etc., which are important on surface on the surface. And uh, here we can see in this diagram, um, I think yesterday we saw this. Um, uh, so this uh, soil stripping is very interesting because it makes it possible to um, see the species which are undesirable and to eliminate the surface of the soil, which is very, very rich uh, for the target uh, species. And so we act here on the dispersion of the species. So I think this has already been presented yesterday. Uh, there are regional two species with a dispersion. Then there is a second filter. So the environmental conditions. Um, so the species already present allow for the development of these species. In this case, um, we uh, work on the dispersion of the species. So how can we do that? The issue is how can we reduce, how can we introduce uh, these species in the marsh? Uh, so um, um, I take them from a reference ecosystem, how at what depth, how to transfer the seeds since they cannot be collected. Something which has been done is an experiment, and so some marshes were developed, which are small marshes, mini marshes, which are um, used only for uh, scientific research. So we have several marshes which have been uh, um, stripped and um, which are watered in an artificial way. We have analyzed the uh, general germination and there is a decrease in um, the seed bank progressively and uh, so at 40, 60 centimeters uh, there are fewer seeds, these are unwanted species and um, so 
it is uh, important to work a different um, depth because there are unwanted species at different depths. Uh, so um, uh, some preference ecosystems have been identified and so other studies were performed. Uh, so the areas which were more interesting uh, with several um, uh, several species, the soil has been collected, which has the bank seed, and uh, then this soil has been introduced in these experimental marshes. And um, there, are, there is a certain number of marshes on which there is no introduction, and um, so uh, we can um, uh, draw uh, some differences. So the results, there are several um, species which have been developed. Uh, so Zanichella um, pentata, Ranunculus pentata, Scaraspera, uh, they are aquatic species and we have seen that in terms of diversity um, there is a, um, an index which is an index of similarity and similarity of communities which measures the proximity uh, among the communities. And here we see the site in which there is soil which has been uh, transferred, which is very close to the donor site, very different from the control site. So there is no being uh, soil control. So uh, this is something uh, important uh, thanks to the transfer of soil, which is the seed bank of the um, communities. Uh, so the um, all communities have been uh, included in these marshes and the results are very important and satisfactory. We have also another effect which is interesting on unwanted um, species, especially weeds from rice fields, and we have these species which are present in um, are not present in the um, reference ecosystem, so they have put in the sectors in which we have transferred the soil and uh, um, uh, this uh, limits uh, the development of uh, unwanted uh, species. So um, the, what can we learn from this experience? We can learn uh, that all the target uh, species, species from the references um, were transferred into these uh, mesocosms. These are operations which are not destructive, even if uh, they are taken uh, in uh, natural marshes, only a few amount is uh, taken, and so the impact uh, is neglectable. So this is very important. There is no destruction, uh, and uh, this is very, um, it is very important that we do not degrade, we do not distract the donor site, the reference site, to restore a new site. And um, we have um, uh, the um, so the quantity of soil which is taken is um, very limited. Uh, we have not spoken about dockery. It is true that in this case we have introduced um, some seeds. We um, have especially spoken about uh, um, the. Um, birds and other animals which go from marsh to marsh and they are the carrier of the transmission of seeds. So they take the seeds from the different marshes uh, and so these are seeds which are connected to their um, hair and their skin and so this makes it possible to introduce these species in the marshes in a very natural way. This is something with it which existed, um, which exists and which is very interesting. So in this uh, way the environment is colonized by these species uh, very quickly and sometimes also when these species are transferred and these species are very difficult uh, to be uh, eradicated and um, this is uh, a problem uh, for um, all these uh, species. So um, uh, when all this is done, we um, uh, um, we go on a full-scale application, so we uh, leave the experimental phase, uh, so we have the creation of um, a marsh with several actors, 
in um, the old um, the old uh, frames. So we have uh, verified. We have done some measurements. So we have seen an important clay layer. We have analyzed the depth of this uh, clay layer. So we uh, see that almost everywhere there is um, a clay layer which is important and which makes it possible to have impermeability of the soil. And um, so we in this study, we see that the water does, is not infiltrated directly. Um, the design of this marsh was uh, created. It was created on um, a geographical IT system. The volumes um, were defined, calculated, and here we can see the need uh, not to export materials. So all the materials uh, were used to create some small islets and uh, they participate in the landscape of the site so there is no import nor export of the sediment materials so it's a big marsh which is made of uh, different uh, uh, channels which um, remind us of the uh, marshes in Kimarg which are historically created through the movement of uh, the um, the Rhone and so this marsh is connected to the historical activity of the Rhone. And so we tried to include uh, the logic of uh, natural creation of these marshes in a restoration project. Here uh, you can see some photos of um, the uh, site. Uh, so um, I will uh, talk about uh, the plant restoration. You have seen uh, several examples. Uh, concrete examples of restriction actions of for population and communities with different techniques of this uh, work um, um, forced within um, planning logic so there are several questions that we have to raise them in from this point of view and i will um, present them quickly here you can see the process a restoration project. So the first phase, which is uh, the planning of uh, restoration. Uh, so we can predict what we've done in a very systematic way. The um, implementation of the project, uh, the performance assessment, and following up the assessment, and the adjustment of the management, adaptive management. <laughs> which will uh, lead to uh, new works and the parameters that we try to follow. And then we have some uh, phases um, of dissemination of the results in order to share the experiences. So for a um, scientific approach, we need to analyze and justify the needs for the restoration because we do not always need to restore sites. There are sites which are very resilient and systems which were destroyed and take a new trajectory, become a new ecosystem. It is an ecosystem that can have a ecological interest and uh, we need to uh, rebuild, for example, in, there is um, an environment which um, had um, agricultural areas and so they try to build uh, an environment which has an ecological value and which was threatened um, and need to be protected so we didn't build something we um, which has a specific um, a specific interest but we destroyed uh, something which uh, was uh, not very interesting from the biodiversity point of view so this justifies the need for the restoration and uh, another thing uh, is that um, the marshes were very destroyed uh, so the impact was very was very strong the approach uh, then has to be strategic and well 
be balanced. We can have an ideal project, but then it must be implemented by different actors. So there is um, there are problems concerning the budget, the technical aspect, and so we need to have the strategy. And we also have to describe the site, uh, which has to be restored. And uh, it is also important to um, describe uh, in a very explicit uh, way uh, with the object uh, the, the different objectives of the project uh, especially we need to detail in a very specific way the ecosystem of the species that we want to develop in that specific area and for this reason we need to identify and describe the reference and we will send a um, historical reference is this site uh, variable which uh, species uh, can we have and which years in which conditions are these um, conditions which are available and um, so it is uh, a site uh, which uh, makes it possible to assess the evolution project uh, so with uh, a very specific description of restoration project and is a scientific uh, foundation so on the scientific um, knowledge on which ecological restoration is based and what is uh, uh, the um, um, the approach to follow so for example we um, use the filters, um, dispersion filters, biotic uh, filters, uh, which is starting from the regional pool, makes it possible to develop a community in a specific area. And so we work specifically on introduction of the species and so the use of dispersion filters. And uh, we must also consider that restoration, even if it is done in very limited uh, spaces, uh, falls within a landscape and will have important effects, especially on uh, the, rest the success of uh, ecological restoration of the site. And uh, here we have, um, we often have actors, some um, the use of uh, parcels of plants that we have to take into account. We need to include uh, the different users, the different actors in the research program since the beginning. So this is something which is very important and which is necessary in order to have uh, uh, a very good um, restoration in the future. So, to continue, in a more pragmatic way, we need to have some budget, we need to have um, the precise planning based on which works can be done. We have works that cannot be um, done, and so we have some uh, constraints due to the respect of uh, the species which are already present and uh, some regulatory issues that we have to take into account. So before starting um, registration, we need to know the initial size of the site. So this is something which is necessary uh, to do. We need to uh, have, but we need to compare pre and post registration. So this is fundamental to show what has been provided through restoration. So it is important to um, include performance benchmarks and monitoring uh, protocols. And uh, restoration is a process, uh, adaptive management project process. And um, we have a continuous questioning during the follow-up of the activities, we need to assess the works, in, and we need to have a frame which is um, smooth, and so we have to go back to the management actions and we have to change them in case of mistakes, so we need to be very flexible and the process is, um, has, be, has to be adaptive. And um, so the strategy 
as to be a strategy for the long-term protection and maintenance of the restored ecosystem. The work is very long, sometimes requires a lot of budget, and so it is important to assure that the resource site uh, must not uh, be destroyed, and so we need to pay a lot of attention. As for the control of follow-up, it is important to have uh, a control site which is not uh, restored, a site which um, can allow us to compare the evolution of the situation of the restored site with a control site. So the control site can be a positive control, so a reference site, so we work in the same way as the restored um, site, or it can be a negative control, so a site which is degraded, which has been destroyed, in order to see whether the reference uh, the restored site um, is far from uh, the degraded uh, situation. Uh, so let's see a strategic uh, vision of the project. Uh, so we take into account the technical aspects and the social economic aspects that rest because restoration can help uh, some social economic um, impact. So we need to have a global vision on the ecological restoration. We have to analyze in a strategic way all the consequences, um, positive or negative, uh, of restoration project, and especially the influence that this project can have on the population and um, the users of uh, water. So we have also the issue concerning the actors that will benefit or not from uh, the management of the restriction. So sometimes uh, the actors will benefit from the status quo, um, opposed or from visible actors who will benefit from the change. So the planning, the planning of uh, um, um, is um, so, so we, we need to justify restoration needs, opportunity, we need to define the general objectives, we need to identify the constraints and opportunities, especially in terms of budget and team, and um, we need to have an assessment of the site, an initial assessment of the site, before the restriction and uh, this allows us to implement all the regulation and administrative uh, context uh, so we need to so the restriction works can be subject to a different uh, type of regulation so in this context uh, the project can um, can be used um, and so it is important to consult stakeholders and users and to develop the very specific objectives and the work plan, which uh, will make it possible to perform restoration. Uh, the monitoring and assessment of the work following a restoration activity makes it possible to reassess the objectives and if the objectives have been achieved, if they are relevant, if they have to be revised. And so this allows us to have a more, um, to have um, a different uh, approach and process and to have a, an adaptive management process. And it is also the opportunity to go back to the population and to include the population in this um, interactive process. So to conclude, I quickly present uh, the monitoring and evaluation of the restoration projects. So we have some goals and objectives where goals achieved. If the goals were achieved, are they general goals, for example, to restore a temporary marsh? The objective can be, the goal can be to restore the development of a community um, of a specific species, a hydrological functioning which is done on a specific date. 
data, so um, something which is more specific and detailed and can be assessed through direct um, um, monitoring measures. Are the results uh, sustainable and the system resilient? Of which um, corrective actions are needed and are corrective actions needed? Uh, so, are the objectives um, do uh, the objective need to be revised? Uh, so, these goals and objectives must be described in a very clear way. And especially, we need to um, see how these objectives are assessed. So we can see how we can, um, we need to analyze the environmental variables, the evaluation criteria, success and clinical criteria of restoration, which um, make it possible to assess the project itself. So for sure, there are some measures to make, which make it possible to measure everything and um, it is important to differentiate uh, the restoration works from the active restoration compared to other environmental variables. For example, uh, climate can have a strong influence on the success of restoration, but um, and um, so we need to try and um, discriminate these environmental variables um, of uh, management operations which uh, have been made. So we know that uh, these operations are, um, we need to know whether these operations are a problem or problematic or if they are successful and we need to adjust them. So the um, strategies must be done through direct comparison, uh, so comparison of parameters between restored system, reference systems, and control systems, and um, so um, parameters can be more or less relevant, um, biotics and abiotics, etc. And we need to analyze the attributes, um, so a list of attributes um, that have to be defined at the start of the project. So, uh, for example, there are some key attributes which make it possible to assess the comparison, to assess uh, the restriction of uh, a site. I believe that uh, the most important thing is to analyze a trajectory and so to place restriction in a um, time context and to assess the trends, to assess the evolution of uh, the environment in comparison with the control and reference environment. Is there an ecosystem which will be close to the reference system? And this is the dynamic, uh, and the dynamic of this is very important because there are some assessment times, which are timelines, which are very long, take many years. And so, uh, this, uh, so the dynamic has to be positive. And this is important because uh, for many years, uh, there is an environment which is restored in a satisfactory, in a satisfactory way. And uh, we need to um, ask a question on the variables. Um, uh, so this um, is just to show uh, that it exists. Uh, so it is a tool for assessing ecosystem recovery. So these are criteria um, in stars, which make it possible to assess any qualitative way, the success of restoration. I'm not elaborate more, but um, this uh, is a system where it makes it possible to assess the success of restoration. I thank you. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. So as of now, there are no questions. I don't know whether there are some participants who want to ask um, questions. <laughs>
so you can also ask questions in um, the chat function in the Q&A uh, section. Re bonjour. Alors on va Welcome back. Now we have the virtual site to visit, but before that we have a question on the role of a sewage directly discharging in the wetlands. This is a big problem. There can be pollution related to sewage in the catchment area or discharged in wetlands. One of the big problems of uh, wetlands is uh, these uh, low areas in catchment areas. And every time something is introduced in this site, there is uh, no water circulation and there is an accumulation of uh, chemical elements. And uh, normally this uh, situation leads to eutrophization. This can be bad and it can completely destroy the environment, not necessarily in uh, a permanent way, because if uh, we stop discharging sewage, there is a certain level of resilience uh, and there can be a mineralization of organic matter in uh, temporary wetlands uh, and uh, this uh, organic matter can be used uh, by vegetables uh, like algae that are quite uh, abundant uh, in this area and that uh, use uh, this uh, organic matter so this can reduce uh, the eutrophization level of course, uh, stopping the discharging of sewage is the first uh, thing to do because uh, this is, uh, of course, a degradation factor for uh, wetlands. Uh. And then uh, also the dry period uh, of uh, wetlands uh, can allow you to go back to a, a favorable ecological uh, status. Uh, generally speaking, uh, not speaking about uh, temporary marshes and wetlands, it is clear that uh, wetlands are natural uh, areas where this uh, sewage is uh, purified. This is a service that is provided. And not all wetlands have the same level of vulnerability to sewage. So we need to make a distinction also in relation to the type of pollution. There is organic pollution. So, for example, um, phosphorus uh, that can enrich the environment. So it may be not so bad. If it is a transition area, uh, so a wetland before the sea in a system of lagoons, so where system of lagoons can stock a part of this sewage, but not a big quantity. And this is something to consider. And that's a, then the second thing is a chemical pollution and not just organic pollution. So there may be soaps that have uh, uh, a lifespan that is quite long and that can have uh, an impact even for centuries. And of course, in this case, uh, uh, pollution uh, uh, cannot be sustained by the natural environment. Some uh, wetlands uh, can be used for the natural uh, purification of sewage. And of course, uh, we need to consider what is uh, the uh, storage capacity. But in any case, uh, this capacity is uh, zero in case uh, we have uh, closed reservoirs. So I hope I have answered the question. <laughs> 
On passe, à, on passe donc à, à la suite si vous n'avez pas d'autres questions. Now we can uh, move on if you do not have other questions. And then of course, if you have others, you can write them in the chat and we will answer at the end of the morning. Now we can make the virtual site visit. We will see the creation of a temporary bond. Voilà, donc je vous rappelle, je vous rappelle pas les consignes hein, que vous avez déjà... I'm not going to repeat the practical information. So, uh, Mediterranean temporary ponds in Camargue region. This is a very variable environment uh, in time and space. There is a seasonal variation that is quite strong. So in spring and in summer, there are differences also according to the different rainfall that we could have. So we can have more or less flooding or dry periods. And this affects the flora and fauna depending on these uh, environments. Uh, temporary uh, ponds in the Camargue uh, are created uh, quite uh, naturally. Uh, they are a dead rows of the Rhone uh, River in Camargue. So when uh, one of these dead uh, rows uh, is deconnected, there is the creation of uh, small water reservoirs that are totally disconnected from uh, the Rhone River. And uh, they are only um, fed by rainfall. There has been a strong destruction between 1942 and 1940, uh, 1984. 67% uh, of natural environments were lost. And this destruction was linked to agriculture, salt farming, and the industry in particular. And there has been the loss of 40,000 hectares of natural environment, of which 33,000 were wetlands. And one of the natural environments that suffered the most are temporary Mediterranean ponds that are small spaces uh, present uh, in this area, mostly salty areas that were used for agriculture and that uh, assisted to a loss of 60% in this period. Another impact that is important relates to water management. And uh, water management affects uh, marshes and ponds. Uh, in the summer, uh, we have the dry period in the Mediterranean, so a period where normally ponds and marshes are dry. There are some uh, organisms that uh, totally depend uh, from uh, this uh, particular dry period in the summer. And, uh, of course, uh, also hunting activities, tourism and bird conservation are affected to a lesser extent. And this can have an impact on the um, fauna and flora that is typical of these uh, areas. Now I am going to show you a video. Uh, that was a shot in Camargue. We have a project to recreate temporary ponds in former uh, agricultural parcels. So here you have uh, the information on how to listen to the original audio. And in a few seconds, I will show you the first uh, video that presents this project. Alors on est au Marais du Viguera, c'est euh, une réserve naturelle en Camargue. Euh, c'est une propriété du conservatoire du littoral, donc ça a un double statut de protection en fait. C'est un statut de protection foncière et un statut de protection réglementaire. Sachant que le statut de réserve naturelle nationale, c'est un des plus forts statuts de protection en France. Et c'est un lieu qui est géré par une association qui s'appelle les Amis des Marais du Viguera, qui a comme mission principale la conservation du patrimoine naturel et qui peut mettre en place des projets de restauration pour des milieux naturels dégradés ou disparus. Et c'est l'objet de ce que j'ai derrière moi, donc qui est une mare temporaire euh, méditerranéenne mais artificielle qui a été créée dans le cadre d'un programme qu'on a coordonné euh, entre 2013 et 2017 euh, dans le cadre d'une un, politique publique qui s'appelait euh, la stratégie nationale pour la biodiversité. Dans ce cadre-là, l'État euh, passe, a passé un appel à projet auquel on a répondu. 
avec un ensemble de partenaires techniques. Bon, donc c'est un gros projet en fait, là il y a une mare derrière moi, mais il y en a une douzaine en réalité, avec un financement principal de l'agence de l'eau euh, Rhône Méditerranée Corse, et puis des participations financières d'autres partenaires financiers. Pour nous, l'intérêt, c'était de regrouper des partenaires techniques divers pour avoir un programme complet sur la question des mares temporaires méditerranéennes qui ont été dégradées, voire qui ont carrément disparu, en général à cause des activités agricoles qui, dont l'objectif est d'avoir des milieux bien propres, hein, c'est le terme qui est utilisé, mais net, euh, voilà, est, tout est nivelé, etc. Et nous, dans les espaces naturels, on essaye de retrouver des... Euh, un semblant de naturel, euh, parce qu'ici on est sur un lieu qui, même s'il est classé réserve naturelle nationale, a encore vraiment les stigmates de son passé agricole. Là on est sur d'anciennes euh, friches euh, risicoles, euh, donc avec, euh, ça se voit peut-être pas bien comme ça à l'œil nu, mais des digues bien droites, des angles droits, enfin voilà, ce qui n'est qui est pas euh, quelque chose de complètement naturel. La coordination technique générale, euh, c'était assuré par nous, le gestionnaire du site. Euh, le volet scientifique était assuré par la Tour du Vala et l'IMBE qui est un, un laboratoire de recherche euh, du CNRS, qui est spécialisé en écologie méditerranéenne. On avait euh, un partenaire euh, spécialisé sur l'éducation à l'environnement, qui est le CPIE Run Pays d'Arles, c'est une association d'éducation à l'environnement. Un laboratoire de recherche euh, et d'études sur les, en sciences humaines, qui s'appelle Ressources, euh, qui travaille sur le volet euh, sociologie, ethnologie. Et puis on avait des partenaires techniques qui ont, ont rejoint le projet parce qu'ils ont reçu des mares eux aussi. Donc il y a le Grand Port Maritime de Marseille qui, euh, qui a la gestion d'un très grand domaine en périphérie de la zone industrielle de Fosse-sur-Mer. Euh, le Parc Naturel de Camargue qui lui aussi est gestionnaire de terrain et le Conservatoire du Littoral parce qu'il est propriétaire de la majorité des sites sur lesquels les mares ont été euh, créés. Voilà. Donc on a essayé, on essaye nous en général de, de, de regrouper différentes disciplines, ça rend le projet assez riche et puis ça permet aussi de l'exporter. C'est-à-dire que euh, c'est chouette d'avoir fait ça pour la réserve, mais c'est aussi chouette de pouvoir faire bénéficier d'autres allant des scolaires jusqu'à des étudiants et peut-être même des professionnels dans le cadre de formation. Une fois que les financements ont été trouvés, on a travaillé avec la Tour du Vala sur euh, les lieux où on pouvait réinstaller des mares, donc qui sont des lieux où on a supposé que dans le passé, lorsque le Rhône était en capacité de divaguer, on avait certainement des petites dépressions qui se remplissaient naturellement euh, par les pluies. Et donc une fois qu'on a déterminé ces lieux-là, on a euh, déterminé avec la Tour du Vala des profils euh, de mares euh, qui correspondent à, à, à des formes alors, qui restent artificielles évidemment, mais qui pouvaient apporter aux espèces qu'on qu visait dans la recolonisation des mares qui pouvait apporter les conditions, on va dire, idéales. Alors ça reste de la, de, la, de la supposition, malgré tout, basée sur des connaissances scientifiques. Donc on a fait des travaux à la pelle mécanique. <rire> ça peut se faire manuellement, mais sur 12 mares avec des, des étendues assez importantes, on a utilisé des moyens mécaniques. Et ensuite, la Tour du Val a réalisé des suivis scientifiques, donc de recolonisation naturelle. Alors c est, c est, il n'y a eu aucun renfort euh, ni apport de graines, ni apport de sol, là c'est vraiment de la recolonisation naturelle. On a eu deux, trois ans de suivi euh, selon les mares, euh, et aujourd'hui on a plus de dix ans de recul, mais avec des suivis qui ont été interrompus. Euh, donc malheureusement, parce que le, le, quand on répond à ce genre d'appel à projet, on a un financement fixe sur euh, cinq ans, là c'était cinq ans, et donc ça ne nous permet pas d'avoir des suivis sur du long terme, ce qui est dommage parce que sur ces milieux-là, on a besoin d'avoir vraiment euh, du recul pour laisser le temps au milieu de cicatriser. Euh, voilà, donc ça c'est quelque chose qui est un peu regrettable et auquel il faut penser quand on se lance dans ce genre de projet. Voilà, donc c'est plutôt joli, euh, on est content, <rire> mais en fait, est-ce qu'on a bien les plantes typiques des mares temporaires méditerranéennes ou pas bah, Ça, on n'est pas franchement capable de le, de le savoir si on n'a pas des spécialistes de la question qui arrivent à venir sur les mares. Selon la Tour du Vala, il faut à peu près 30 ans pour savoir si le milieu retrouve des caractéristiques d'une mare naturelle. Donc 30 ans, on n'y est quand même pas, c'est long. Et pour un financeur, 30 ans, c'est un délai qui est quand même hyper compliqué à envisager. Donc moi, j'alerte quand même là-dessus, c'est que euh, creuser des trous, c'est bien, mais, euh, mais il faut quand même euh, s'assurer de ce qu'on a fait après derrière. Sur le, le volet pédagogique, on a eu deux types d'actions. Euh, vraiment une action de rendre une mare accessible au public. Celle qu'on voit ici est sur la réserve naturelle nationale. Le public qui est accompagné peut l'apercevoir, mais il ne va pas s'en approcher. Euh, par contre, on a une mare euh, sur le site qui est équipée de pontons, 
sur lequel le, le grand public, hein, les familles par exemple qui visitent le site, vont pouvoir circuler librement euh, et vont pouvoir accéder au, au cœur de la mare. En fait, on, on a créé des pontons qui s'avancent dans l'eau de manière à ce que, euh, au fur et à mesure où la mare va sécher, euh, les gens puissent s'approcher euh, vraiment au cœur du système en quelque sorte et l'observer du plus proche possible. Euh, Sauf qu'une mare temporaire méditerranéenne, quand elle sèche, il nous faut quand même un peu des indications parce que ça ne s'invente pas, le fait que ce soit un milieu riche, avec des formes de résistance, etc. Donc on a créé avec le CPI Rhône Pays d'Arles et un dessinateur local qui s'appelle Cyril Girard, un livret pédagogique euh, dans lequel on, on a essayé de traduire de façon plutôt drôle, euh, des, des informations scientifiques euh, sûres. Voilà. Et puis il y a aussi des animations vraiment qui sont menées, en particulier par le CPE Rhône Pays d'Arles qui était partenaire du projet, euh, et qui en plus de ça a créé un, un outil de ressources euh, dans lequel euh, il euh, y a toute une bibliographie et puis des éléments clés qui permettent à des instituteurs, euh, des professeurs de, de différents niveaux ou des animateurs environnement de, de construire une, une animation d'éducation à l'environnement euh, et de sensibilisation à la question des mares temporaires méditerranéennes. C'est un sujet sur lequel on n'a pas un énorme retour aujourd'hui parce que bah, la construction d'un sentier ça prend du temps, euh, mais les animations ont lieu et visiblement ça fonctionne plutôt bien. Très bien, donc euh, merci à, à Leila Debes d'avoir fait cette, cette présentation sur ce Thank you, Leila, for making this presentation on the project site. The goal of this uh, project was the creation of temporary Mediterranean ponds with a natural hydrogeologically functioning in former agricultural plots, but also the creation of habitats favorable to the species that depend on this habitat, in particular Lestes macrostigma, that is a type of dragonfly that depends on these habitats and that is an endangered species. Generally speaking, another goal is the creation of favorable conditions for the establishment of the targeted communities, including flora and fauna. Here, uh, I show you this slide again. Here, we have not used the dispersion of seeds. Species were introduced, were not introduced. We basically restored uh, favorable environmental conditions, but without introducing the species. And uh, we didn't uh, use interactions between plants, the presence of herbivores uh, uh, may limit the presence of uh, plants, but this impact is not so strong. The different uh, sites that were presented are uh, shown uh, here. In these sites, uh, ponds were uh, recreated. And in particular, we started this uh, site uh, um, with the red circle, that is the Vigura site. And uh, for example, in this image that you have already seen before, you can see the former Uh, pond that was then used for agricultural purposes and uh, then it was uh, studied uh, in different conditions, uh, grazing, uh, not grazing, uh, flooding, not flooding, and uh, then a certain number of temporary ponds uh, were uh, recreated and today it is an area that is uh, quite freely developing and uh, it can uh, host these uh, temporary ponds. It is a site that is uh, uh, limited if you want, uh, fenced, uh, but you can still see the dikes. Uh, and uh, all these uh, catchment areas basically collect the uh, rainfalls. Uh, Some preliminary studies were carried out uh, to recreate these uh, ponds, and ponds should only collect rainwater. But uh, should not be wet uh, all year round. They have to be dry for a certain part of the year. And uh, Therefore, a certain soil impermeability is uh, required. Some uh, pathology and hydrology preliminary studies were uh, carried out in order to study and assess the soil texture depths. Uh, 
And there is also another aspect that was uh, studied and that uh, concern the salty aquifer that is uh, present uh, even in the summer. The uh, water, this water should not uh, infiltrate uh, these ponds. Otherwise, uh, these ponds uh, would not dry out in the summer. Here you can see some of the results of these preliminary studies that were carried out. You can see the catchment area that was sized and the pond that was artificially, artificially created. And you can see also the volume of this pond that was calculated based on the catchment area that was delimited. And then also rainfalls uh, were studied. We had a uh, model of the theoretical water level uh, in the pond based uh, on uh, the uh, rainfalls in the last years. Then there were the implementation works and we dug the uh, pond and the monitoring study was uh, carried out uh, regarding hydrological aspects. And uh, almost every year we've checked that there is a period where the area is uh, uh, dry based on the flooding and evaporation conditions. So we meet uh, quite well the environmental conditions as expected. Then we also carried out another um, preliminary study uh, on the seed bank, and here you can see the results uh, of the seed bank. And uh, you can see that we mainly have uh, seeds uh, typical of salty areas, uh, and not many species typical of uh, temporary ponds. So we decided that we had to, to introduce uh, some uh, species. Uh, particular target species, but uh, um, mostly we let the area develop uh, quite uh, naturally. So we made uh, uh, an experiment, a test, to see whether dispersion of uh, uh, fauna was uh, happening. And now I'm going to show you another video with a virtual visit of the site seven years later. And he, in this video, we focus on vegetation. So please uh, listen to the video as indicated in the instructions. On est ici au Marais du Viguera, on est devant une mare qui s'appelle la mare du Clos des Vaches, qui est une mare qui a été créée artificiellement en 2014. Et c'est une mare qui a été créée dans une ancienne partielle rizicole, donc une friche, une friche agricole. Donc c'est un terrain qui historiquement était entièrement plat, qui a été aplani pour les besoins de l'agriculture, et dans lequel on a recréé on va dire, de l'hétérogénéité de topographique qui permet une accumulation d'eau dans une, dans une partie basse, qui est devenue une mare temporaire. Donc c'est une mare qui... Qui, euh, qui en eau une partie de l'année et que ça sèche l'été. Donc je vous propose d'aller voir un peu quel type de végétation se développe aujourd'hui, donc huit ans après sa création, euh, dans la mare. Voilà, donc on a par exemple cette plante qui fait des petites fleurs blanches qu'on voit, euh, qu voit un peu partout là, à la surface de l'eau. Donc c'est une renoncule, une renoncule aquatique, une plante qui est enracinée dans le sédiment, mais qui se développe euh, dans l'eau et qui fleurit à la surface. Euh, c'est une espèce qui est assez commune dans les, dans les marais temporaires naturels. Euh, donc euh, finalement, c'est plutôt une bonne nouvelle de la retrouver dans cette mare qui a été, qui a été créée, euh, parce que ça veut dire que les conditions des marais euh, temporaires naturels sont respectées et qu'on a une, une espèce qui est typique de ce milieu-là, qui arrive aujourd'hui à, à s'y développer. C'est aussi une plante qui était connue dans la banque de graines. C'est-à-dire qu'on euh, a prélevé du sol et regardé les espèces qui étaient présentes déjà sous forme de graines. Euh, finalement, en creusant la mare, on a favorisé cette espèce puisqu'on a créé une zone qui était en eau euh, plus longtemps et qui lui permettait de se, vraiment de se développer, de fleurir et de fructifier. Euh, mais c'est une espèce qui était déjà là avant euh, le creusement de la mare. Alors si on, si on regarde d'autres plantes, par exemple ici, 
on a une petite plante aquatique. Donc ça, c'est un calitriche. Euh, c'est même calitriche troncata. Donc c'est une plante aquatique qui est vraiment typique des, des mares temporaires méditerranéennes en Camargue. C'est aussi une plante qui est en fait très rare en dehors d'un de, certain nombre de, de marais camargués. Et ça, c'est une espèce qui typiquement n'était pas du tout dans la banque de graines. Donc c'est une espèce qui a probablement été amené par la faune, donc par exemple par l'avifaune, par les oiseaux d'eau, les canards par exemple, euh, qui, en se promenant de mare en mare, euh, transporte aussi un petit peu de sédiments et un petit peu de, et un petit peu de graines de ces, de ces plantes, et qui a très probablement introduit cette espèce dans, dans la mare. Donc ça, c'est encore une espèce qui vise à, à, à dire que cette mare qui a été recréée il y a, il y a à peine 8 ans, euh, est quand même assez proche du point de vue de la végétation des marais qui sont eux parfaitement naturels. Donc on peut continuer un peu à, à fouiller. Donc là on a une nouvelle plante qui est une plante vraiment assez commune finalement, qui est une, une zanichelli, donc une, une petite espèce annuelle des, des milieux aquatiques temporaires qui elle aussi est assez, assez commune et assez fréquente dans les, dans les milieux aquatiques temporaires naturels. C'est aussi une plante qui est assez, on va dire, pionnière, qui peut se développer de manière abondante dans les premiers stades, euh, suite à la, à la création de, de, de ce genre de milieu, et qui petit à petit euh, va un peu diminuer en abondance et euh, trouver en, en quelque sorte une, une proportion un peu plus équilibrée avec les autres espèces aquatiques. Ça, c'est de nouveau une espèce qui n'était pas présente dans la banque de graines, historiquement, qui n'a en tout cas pas été identifiée dans cette mare-là. Euh, donc c'est probablement une espèce qui a également été introduite, euh, qui a été disséminée par, euh, par la faune, donc soit par les oiseaux d'eau, soit par euh, la faune terrestre comme les sangliers. Alors en fouillant, on trouve d'autres types de, de plantes. Donc, par exemple ici, on a des, des algues filamenteuses. La première chose que ça peut indiquer, si ces algues sont, sont abondantes, c'est un fort niveau trophique. Ça veut dire qu'il y a euh, une forte concentration d'éléments nutritifs dans l'eau, par exemple de l'azote, du phosphore, euh, qui peuvent être liés à l'histoire agricole du milieu, puisque c'est un ancien terrain agricole, donc on peut avoir un stock d'azote ou de phosphore qui est important dans le sol et qui est plus important que dans les milieux naturels. Et cette euh, quantité d'éléments nutritifs euh, elle peut être utilisée soit par des plantes aquatiques enracinées, soit par euh, des, plantes, euh, des, plantes fila des algues filamenteuses, donc des algues. Dans le cas où on a peu de plantes aquatiques qui se développent, par exemple parce qu'on n'avait pas ces plantes-là dans la banque de graines ou parce qu'elles n'ont pas été amenées par les, euh, par, les, par les oiseaux ou par les sangliers, euh, on va avoir ces algues filamenteuses qui se développent de manière très importante. Si on a euh, plus de plantes aquatiques enracinées, plus de macrophytes ou de plantes, de plantes à fleurs, euh, on va directement utiliser, on va préempter tous ces nutriments et ça va un peu court-circuiter le développement des algues. Donc on va dire, si la restauration ne fonctionne pas bien et que les plantes, les plantes aquatiques qu'on attend ne se développent pas bien, on peut avoir ces plantes-là qui se développent de manière très abondante. Euh, si le milieu est très eutrophe, donc s'il y a vraiment beaucoup, beaucoup d'azote ou de phosphore, de toute manière, ces plantes-là vont, vont se développer. Et donc ça, c'est plutôt indicateur d'un dysfonctionnement ou d'un problème dans, le, dans la trajectoire de restauration. Euh, à savoir qu'un milieu aquatique euh, atteint ses, ses, sa végétation de référence, donc la végétation qu'on espère obtenir quand on restaure un milieu, euh, dans un laps de temps qui est de l'ordre d'une trentaine d'années. Donc ici on est à 8 ans après la création de la mare, euh, et en moyenne il faut attendre 30 ans avoir, avant d'avoir une végétation de milieux artificiels qui convergent vers celle des milieux naturels. C'est finalement pas très étonnant d'avoir un volume assez important d'algues filamenteuses encore aujourd'hui. On est plutôt sur une situation assez positive où le milieu ressemble déjà fortement à une végétation de milieux naturels, mais on a encore quelques signes qui nous permettent de voir qu'on est dans un milieu qui est assez récent et qui n'est pas du tout mature et diversifié comme un milieu naturel. Très bien, donc ça c'est euh, en ce qui concerne euh, la flore. Et donc, Very well, this was a video about vegetation. And now we have another video by Philippe Lambert. It's going to present the situation of fauna 
and the case of Odonets in particular. Alors, je m'appelle Philippe Lambré, je suis chef de projet à la Tour du Valat et je travaille à la conservation des, des odonates, c'est-à-dire des libellules, notamment à travers des projets de, de restauration d'habitat. Ici, au, dans la réserve naturelle des Marais du Viguera, il y a une dizaine d'années, on a mené un de ces projets de, de restauration en faveur des libellules et notamment l'espèce macrosigma qui est vraiment, vraiment menacée. Euh, et ce projet de restauration consistait à creuser des mares temporaires saumâtres qui se trouve être l'habitat de prédilection de cette espèce de libellule. Il y a plusieurs mares temporaires qui ont été créées, et juste ici, il y a une de celles-ci, qu'on va pouvoir aller regarder d'un petit peu plus près maintenant. Ici, on est dans une mare temporaire. C'est une mare qui est temporairement en eau. Donc ici, vous voyez qu'il y a de l'eau sur la totalité de la surface de, de cette mare, mais au fur et à mesure que le printemps et l'été vont progresser, cette mare va s'assécher au fur et à mesure. Le profil de la mare a été un point important du projet de restauration. Euh, ça veut dire bah, simplement le, le plan de coupe. Vous voyez ici, on a une berge abrupte qui permet aux larves de libellule, même quand il, y a il reste très peu d'eau, de pouvoir grimper et, euh, et émerger de, de l'eau pour pouvoir se transformer en adulte. Et puis à partir du moment où on part de cette zone la plus profonde, on va remonter vraiment très doucement le long d'une berge en, en pente douce qui va permettre le développement de différents types de plantes, celles qui vont avoir besoin de beaucoup d'eau, donc celles qui vont être plutôt dans les zones profondes, et celles qui ont besoin de moins d'eau, donc celles qui vont être un peu plus vers, vers la berge et qui vont subir une période d'assec un petit peu plus longue. On peut parler également de la colonisation de, de cette mare par les libellules. En fait, chez les libellules, il y a deux stratégies de, de ponte. La première, ça consiste à déposer les œufs à la surface de l'eau. Donc, bah, Vous voyez que là, partout où il y a de l'eau, il y a des libellules qui vont pouvoir déposer leurs œufs. Une autre stratégie, ça va consister à déposer les œufs dans la végétation qui est émergée. Alors, la végétation émergée, c'est par exemple ce tout, petit, euh, ce tout petit fragmite que vous voyez ici. Vous voyez que c'est une plante qui a les pieds dans l'eau, mais par contre sa tige sort de l'eau. Donc ça c'est une plante qui peut être utilisée par les libellules qui déposent leurs œufs dans, euh, dans la végétation. On a également euh, ici un jonc maritime dont les, certaines tiges plongent dans l'eau et ça c'est un support qui va être notamment utilisé par euh, l'estès macrostigma. En fait on s'attendait à avoir beaucoup plus de développement de ces plantes-là sur la berge en pente douce. Donc même si euh, L'espèce macrostigma arrive à se reproduire dans cette mare parce qu'il y a quelques endroits où elle peut déposer des, ses œufs. On n'a pas une population non plus énormément développée parce qu'il manque de support de ponte. Et donc un des prochains projets, ce serait de favoriser le développement de la végétation en, en semant des graines d'espèces que, que, qu qui sont utilisées par ces libellules. Très bien, merci à, à Philippe Lambré pour... pour Thank you. For um, this video. So, as I was saying, we worked on uh, the issue of environmental questions to make them capable. Um, we uh, see that in uh, uh, the Express and there was um, natural colonization. Okay, the sun was very low. Sorry. Okay, so, so now it's better. Um, so um, we um, have to consider interactions with other organisms, uh, between plants. Uh, uh, so um, today, after this first uh, result, um, in an interactive um, um, logic, uh, we can um, we can force uh, the dispersion of some species which have not divided on the site, especially uh, some sites which um, would allow for a more important um, reproduction of um, um, of these um, of these ashes which are connected to these temporary marshes. 
So if we create uh, favorable ecological conditions, um, they uh, which have an autonomous uh, functioning, um, a, a young system, uh, favorable project. So this is uh, good news. But some years after the creation of this environment, uh, they cannot be just like the natural um, ecosystems. They need time to become like the uh, natural ones. So it is a project uh, which is um, very original because it integrates uh, uh, social problems uh, and especially for integrate societal issues, especially in terms of education. So once again, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, it will be a pleasure to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do not have any questions so far, but um, I leave you uh, some time. Maybe you need some time to think of a question.